Hi everyone. Now that we've explained the basic workings of the circular flow, I just want to show you how we can use the circular flow to illustrate some important economic intuition. And an obvious place to start is to start with fiscal policy, which is just a fancy way of saying what's the effect of on the economy of the government's decision to tax a little bit more or less, um, increase transfer payments or government spending by a little bit more or less. All right. So uh, it's easiest probably to focus in on government spending, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that. But what I want you to understand is the argument for why it's uh, why you might think that if the government spends a little bit more, that will increase the size of the economy and maybe increase employment. I also want you to understand some limitations to that argument. And we can all do all that with the circular flow diagram. So, here we go. Suppose for the sake of argument, the government goes ahead and spends an extra $100 billion, so plus $100 billion, okay, on goods and services. So it buys roads, bridges, maybe buys more tanks, or whatever it is the government's buying, then that's going to be an extra $100 billion worth of revenue here for firms. Oops, in fact, let me not put that there. Let me put that, I'm going to put something else there in a minute. So put plus 100 billion here in revenue. Now the firms have to decide what to do with that extra revenue. If they want to go ahead and replace the materials that they use to build the roads, the bridges, or whatever, or the tanks, or whatever it was that the government was buying, then they're going to have to go ahead and hire land, labor, and capital. Alternatively, if they decide to just keep, um, if they just decide to return the revenue to households in the form of profits, it's going to the owners of capital. But in either case, it's going to be plus $100 billion worth of payments up here. Okay, So there's $100 billion worth of payments that go into factor markets, and since all factors of production are ultimately owned by some household, that's an extra plus $100 billion in income down here, so households' income goes up. Now, at that point, households can do something um, with that extra $100 billion. They can save it, they can pay, they'll can they have to pay some of it in taxes, or they can um, uh, purchase goods and services with it. So there might be extra spending down here in the bottom part of the circular flow as well. The key point is when the government goes out and spends more, that can, can create an extra $100 billion worth of expenditure, so you increase the size of the economy down here in the, um, uh, in the goods and services market, so you're increasing total expenditures, and also you're increasing the amount of income generated in the factor market, so you're increasing the total amount of income generated. Okay? In addition, <clears throat> because incomes go up, households will spend more, which will lead to more revenue for firms, which will lead to more payments in factor markets and even more income. And that's the multiplier effect you may have been reading about in the press, and we'll talk about that a lot more detail when we get into the chapter on fiscal policy at the end of the course. So, and that's a fine story as far as it goes, but what it does, but what it ignores, or what you have to take into account, which, is, which qualifies the answer, is where does the government get this initial $100 billion from? I mean, yes, if the government goes out and spends an extra $100 billion, it has all the effects I just said. That's revenue for firms, which is income for some households, and those households go out and spend, which is revenue for other firms and income for even more households, and as a result, the size of the economy can expand. But the key question is, where does the government get that $100 billion from? And what effect does that have on our story, if at all? Well, if you're a government and you're going to spend an extra $100 billion on goods and services, you could do $100 billion less of transfer payments. Right? But if you decrease transfer payments by $100 billion, then that's going to reduce household income. And what's that going to do? That's going to reduce consumption expenditures. So you'll have an extra $100 billion of government spending down here in the market for goods and services. But at the same time, you'll also have fewer consumption expenditures by households down here in the market for goods and services. So on balance, how much does total spending increase in the market for goods and services? Right now, we can't tell because we, we haven't gotten to the point where I can describe a theory that tells you how households uh, respond to their or how household consumption responds to income. We'll get there later on. Right? But the important thing is this would decrease um, consumption. Let's say for the sake of argument, let's say it decreases it by $90 billion. Okay? Well, that means if you decrease consumption by $90 billion, then uh, and you increase government spending by $10 billion, then there's only an extra 
or you increase government spending by $100 billion, there's only an extra $10 billion worth of spending in the market for goods and services. So the effect of the fiscal stimulus or the increase in government spending on the economy is going to be dramatically less. Likewise, the government could go ahead and fund it by raising taxes by $100 billion. But the same thing is going to happen then. If households are uh, paying an extra $100 billion worth of taxes, then their disposable income falls by $100 billion, so they're going to have to con cut consumption spending, just like they did when transfer payments fell. And let's say, for simplicity, we'll keep it at $90 billion. Well, then again, down here in the market for goods and services, that's an extra, or that's only going to be an extra $10 billion worth of spending down here in the market for goods and services. So, yeah, the increase in government spending will have a larger effect, uh, will um, increase uh, spending in the economy, but it won't be as nearly as much as you might initially think. All right. Well, then, where, can the, where else can the government get the money from if it doesn't want to, say, cut transfer payments like unemployment and Social Security and it doesn't want to raise taxes on households? Well, it could get it from loans. So one place, it could be plus $100 billion worth of loans from financial markets. Well, that's nice. Because then households don't have to cut, um, you know, disposable income doesn't fall by household, uh, household disposable income doesn't fall, so you won't get the decrease in consumption expenditures here. So the government gets the loans from the financial sector, it then goes out and spends, and that results in an extra $100 billion worth of revenue and ultimately $100 billion worth of income. Okay? But that itself is missing something because the financial sector has to get the money from somewhere. It's got to get it from savings from somebody. Which means the only way the financial sector can continue to make all the loans it was making before and make an extra $100 billion worth of loans to the government is if some households save more. Well, if the households save an extra $100 billion, and that means they're going to be making, they're not going to go ahead and decrease consumption by $90 billion, they're going to have to go ahead and decrease consumption by more than that, be $100 billion. And as a result, you'll have $100 billion less um, household spending in the market for goods and services and $100 billion more of government spending. So you really haven't done anything to the size of the economy. You may have changed you know, which firms are getting the revenue because what the government buys may not be the same as what households buy. But I think you get the point that the total amount of spending in the market for goods and services wouldn't necessarily go up in that scenario. Likewise, if uh, households are unwilling to save more, then in financial, financial markets are going to have to get the funds from someplace, so they'll have to go ahead and decrease loans to the household sector. Okay? And again, if households get $100 billion less in loans, then they've got to have to cut the consumption spending by $100 billion. So you'll have $100 billion less of consumption spending um, and $100 billion more worth of government spending, so you haven't really done much to increase the size of the economy. All right. And everything I just said for the households over here on the left would also be true for the firms. You know, it could be firms would have to save more or, house, or firms would have to get fewer loans from uh, the financial sector and reduce, invest, in that case, investment spending, not consumption spending. Okay? All right, then. So at this point, some of you might be saying, all right, so what's the whole point of government spending or of using fiscal policy to try to stimulate the economy? If... You know, if the financial sector's got to get the funds from someplace or the government has to get the funds from someplace, it doesn't look like there's going to be much, if any, effect of um, increasing government spending on the economy. And the answer is, well, <clears throat> I'd have to, the graph is getting pretty messy, so I'm not going to actually try to do it here. But there's two ways that uh, government spending could be more stimulative and have a larger effect on the economy. One is we assume that these households were U.S. households, so we are still ignoring the rest of the, um, the world. Well, as it turns out, if the savings for the, that provide the loan, or the source of funds for the government loans, where it's not savings by U.S. households, but say savings by households in Japan, China, United Kingdom, and other countries, then it won't be U.S. households cutting back on their consumption. It'll be households in China, Japan, the United Kingdom, and other countries that are cutting back on their consumption. So you won't have this minus 100 billion here. You'll just have the positive, the increased 100 billion dollars worth of government spending financed by loans from abroad, which then leads to you know, extra 100 billion dollars of revenue for U.S. firms, which is then an extra 100 billion dollars worth of payments in fact to markets, an extra 100 billion dollars worth of um, 
income for households who then can go out and spend more. Right? So if the source of the funding for the government spending is from outside the United States, in that case, then, it, yeah, it looks like um, uh, government fiscal policy might have a, a potentially large effect on the economy. Now, that might have some side effects on, say, what happens to our exports and imports, and we'll talk about that later on. But for right now, I think you, we can safely say they would be more stimulative if the government, the source of the funds for the $100 billion the government spending was from outside the United States. The other way that uh, fi uh, fiscal policy could be quite stimulative, if instead of borrowing the money, or instead of um, the government getting the money from financial markets, it simply printed the money itself. Okay, And that gets us into the realm of monetary policy and the role of central banks in the economy. But let's just say for right now, if the government created the extra $100 billion, just printed $100 billion worth of you know $1 bills or $10 bills or whatever it is, and use that money to go ahead and pay for the roads, the bridges, and the tanks that it bought, then again, it, the government is the source of its own funding, so it's not going to have to get taxes or cut transfer payments or get loans from U.S. households or even from the rest of the world. And so in that case, the extra $100 billion worth of government spending would actually be uh, extra $100 billion in rev or spending in the economy as a whole, which ultimately would be an extra $100 billion worth of income for households who then go out and spend more, etc. And so then that could um, be quite stimulative for the economy as well. All right, so that's the basic intuition for um, fiscal policy. If you guys have questions on this, well, I'll go ahead and post some more videos with uh, some clarifications on it. But I just wanted to get you, uh, give you a sense of sort of the interconnectionness between households, firms, the government, the financial sector, and these other two markets, and give you an idea of how you can systematically think about um, important policy issues using this circular flow diagram. So that's it for now.